I want everyone to raise their hands. A little group participation, yeah, feels good. All right, put your hand down. Not yet, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Sorry. This is Silicon Valley, everyone was a little eager um, to, to run ahead. Put your hand down if you know another lesbian in tech besides Megan Smith, other than Kara Swisher. Kara Swisher down, <laughs> I know, I know, down. And you should probably put your back hand back up if you didn't know that Megan or Kara were lesbians. Just, no? Okay. So I'm the founder of an organization called Lesbians Who Tech, and I didn't know any other lesbians in tech actually when I started the organization. So of course I asked Megan to speak back in 2014, and not only did she say yes, but she showed up first before anyone. I'm talking 7 a.m. She was at Google X at the time, her red puffy coat. She was in the back, and not only did she get there first, but she stayed to the very end. She actually left before I did. And that's what Megan does. She shows up. She shows up for her community, her country, and everyone, really, that uh, gets, gets the joy to know her. The second time I asked her to speak, uh, when uh, the White House actually asked us to produce a LGBT tech summit, so of course I asked her to speak. Again, she changed her summer plans to be there. And it was actually at that event that she was recruited to be the Chief Technology Officer of the United States. I want you to think about that. Megan's ability to show up and the impact that has not only on our government, our country, but the millions of women that got to see her be the CTO, queer women and LGBTQ people all over the country. And even, I think you, Ryan, impacted you. Of course. So, uh, Leanne, I'm so happy that you hosted that event because if you didn't, I would never have gotten the chance to work for Megan Smith, who was the first female CTO, but also the first engineer CTO as well. So um, I got really lucky, because at the White House, I got to see Megan Smith in action. President Obama had asked her to advise him, his entire senior leadership team, and agencies across the government how to use data and technology to improve the lives of, of the American people. She also ensured that the United States is the best place for entrepreneurs and innovators by supporting breakthrough work all the way from Palo Alto to Pittsburgh and also investing in STEM education for our littlest of kids to also the folks who are later in their careers. There literally is no one like Megan in the world. Most people uh, make sure that they have a seat at the table. But when Megan never gets a seat at the table, she ensures she brings two more people along with her. And that's actually something that more of us need to do. Being like Megan is walking into a meeting, looking around the room and seeing whose voice is missing, running out of that room and actually bringing those people in there to be part of the conversation. Megan, when she sees a panel, will also find a way to sit chair her chair with another person who's not represented. Megan's a catalyst. If folks working in government thought that she would slow down, they were so wrong. Every challenge she came across, whether it was improving our justice system or trying to bring internet connectivity to the next billion people, it was an opportunity for her to find the pockets of talent across government and bring them together to get them to work together to build a better future for us. And we have countless stories of Megan. I'm sure many of you in this very room have stories. I have one last one. I was in an event with Megan, Hillary Clinton was speaking, and she turned to me and said, follow me. And when Megan asked you to follow her, you just say yes. And within seconds, we were running, weaving through crowds. She introduced me to Valerie Jarrett. We talked about her learning how to code. She introduced me to Kamala Harris, the then, then California Attorney General. And all of a sudden, before I knew her, she was introducing me to Hillary Clinton. And not only did she introduce me, but she said, this is Leanne Pittsford. She's the founder of an organization called Lesbians Who Tech. And they just had a summit with 1,200 lesbians in, in the Castro, and I was obviously about to stutter, and, and Hillary said, Leanne, how are you gonna to top that next year? And I said, without dropping a beat, thank God, um, Madam Secretary, I think the only thing is if you would join us next year. And she chuckled. But that's what Megan does, that's the magic of Megan. She doesn't just get herself in the room, she brings you with her, she lifts you up, she lifts her voice. This is what leadership looks like. This is what visionary leadership looks like. So Leanne and I are honored to be presenting the 2017 Visionary Award. And it's a lesbian suit tech tradition to bring onto the stage all of our favorite leaders um, and the people we love with a slow clap. So if you could please join me in welcoming Megan to the stage. It's incredible to be with you guys. Thank you guys. 
um, to the forum. Thank you for recognizing me. Um, I, I wanted to talk to you guys about three things. And maybe the first one starts with uh, getting off an airplane from Tokyo, uh, the first time I came to Silicon Valley. Uh, I went and I crashed at my friend Steve Perlman's house. And uh, I started at a company called General Magic, which was way early uh, beginning cell phone company. It was probably uh, the beginning of, of smartphones. And in that early experience is everything about our valley, which is apprenticeship, journeyman, master experiences that we have. And I got to meet, work with the most extraordinary team, as each of us have as we've come here. And we learned. And one of those folks I want to bring in the room is a guy named Wendell Sanders, who had worked at Fairchild. Uh, and between Wendell and his son Brian, I think they've had a chip in almost every Apple product ever. Um, and the heritage of getting to work with those masters whose shoulders we stand on and then we grow from working with them is what this valley is all about. You know, and these amazing people, the 20-somethings of Silicon Valley, some of the ones I work together with are like Andy Rubin and Tony Fidel. Tony had driven from Michigan, love of music as a DJ, love of tech, you know, went on, of course, to make the iPod with Steve. Andy Rubin is Andy Droid Android. Uh, Amy Barnett, Pierre Omidyar, we are all young 20-somethings, and it, that's that experience that we have here of coming, you know, we were in Dog City, which is that building in Castor Street on, on, uh, in Mountain View that people would see the lights on at all hours. Phil Goldman, Zarko Dragonic, and we were in there working on our passion projects, as we do as young ones in the valley, as the apprentices. Um, and we got to work with extraordinary giants. Uh, I got to work with um, Joanna Hoffman, Susan Kerr. Every graphic that we see is Susan. Um, Bill Atkinson, Andy Hertzfeld, all of them. And it passes down through all of us. And every single person in this room I know has, you can think of the people you learned from. So it's in the community of Silicon Valley that I just want to sort of be proud of us and be thankful for and hope that we can bring that all around the world. The other thing to notice is that uh, Early on in the gay rights movement um, in the 90s, a guy named Michael Signorelli was writing a book about the closet. And he was writing about Hollywood and the oppression there, and DC and the oppression in government, and New York and the oppression in media. And Tom Riley, who founded Planet Out, which was a company that I ran, um, said, Michael, you're leaving out a chapter. It's called The Silicon Solution. And it was about how Silicon Valley was so embracing of the gay community, much more so than other communities. And it's exactly right in our meritocracy culture uh, that was true. And we led the way with the gay community's inclusion in the workforce. Um, Apple, AT&T, and others, IBM, were really giants there. And many of the leaders from Apple, uh, Elizabeth Birch and others, went on to found the Human Rights Campaign uh, sort of rebirth with the equal sign logo and brought sort of Apple's branding culture into civil rights. So, you know, we really are at that heart. Tomorrow, Tim Cook will give the commencement at MIT. And uh, our, our, it's nice to be with Neri because our, our, our motto at MIT is mind and hands, mens et manas, and the secret word at core and heart. You know, Carnegie Mellon says, the heart is in the work. And it's in the passion and the intensity and the love uh, and the wonder that we all thrive here in the valley. It really matters a lot. The second area that I just wanted to touch on is, you know, Todd Park is here, who is uh, my fellow CTO, second CTO of the United States. And that experience of our government. A lot of people don't know the history of the United States with science and technology, but um, President Washington started the Army Corps of Engineers. It was called the Corps of Engine. It was founded with the Continental Army, the very first penny ever created for the United States of America in 1792 said liberty, the parent of science and industry, it was done by Franklin, Washington, and Jefferson. So we have this deep history um, of, of science and technology, and we were honored to be able to be leaders in this time. One of the challenges we have is that um, we've gotten really separate government and tech, and we've gone apart from each other. And so we were able to begin to bring that back together. Of course, government has amazing technical people like the NASA team, the NIH team, but the day-to-day -day part of government was missing all of us. Uh, and it's interesting because you think in Silicon Valley, the engineers rule, and probably the communications and policy people are at the bottom. But in government, it's the opposite. In fact, in government, the engineers aren't even in the room. 
They're in the vendor land. <laughs> and we want to buy everything from outside, but we need to have a few Surgeon General equivalents who speak that language so we get the architecture right in the room. And so we were able to bring policy people who were technical, uh, we call it TQ, the like tech IQ, in the room for the conversations on net neutrality and cybersecurity and others. We didn't have computer scientists at the main principal table prior to this work when we were making decisions like that, which is crazy. So we were lucky to be able to do that. And Todd started the march into Silicon Valley. We brought over 500 people with Jen Palka and others who structured the United States Digital Service the 18F team, which is also all around the country, the Presidential Innovation Fellows, of which Brian was one, or Ryan was one, and these teams are all of us rotating in government and having a term of service to build the kind of things that you can do at Amazon and Facebook and Google and Twitter and Dropbox, but in our government for the American people. And it's the most extraordinary service work to be able to do. You know, you shouldn't, you, you can get your visa card if you lose it in two days, but you get your green card, you have to wait nine months. So all that stuff needs to go away and we have to be awesome and design with for our veterans, for our foster children, for all of that. And so we were able to do that. We also did things like Tech Hire, the mayor of San Jose was here. Tech Hire is just using code boot camps to get more Americans into the 600,000 jobs that pay 50% more than the average American salary. We were just in Appalachia with one of those programs. Uh, a thousand coal miners tried for 50 slots, and so they were graduating, and we had the congressman from here, Southern Silicon Valley, Democrat, freshman, and the congressman from Appalachia, very senior Republican uh, congressman, sitting next to each other, rebuilding uh, Silicon Valley, Silicon Hollow connections. Silicon Holler, if I say it right. So thinking about how we continue to upgrade this country and be as great as we have in each of its times was part of the work that we were working on, and it was an honor to get to do that. And I'll tell you, even though it's a very complicated time, I, I was in Paris in a hackathon in the palace with 300 people from 70 different countries, Indonesia, Kenya, France, us, Canada, Mexico, hacking and working on the civil code where Napoleon wrote the civil code. So there really is digital, open, data-driven, collaborative government coming. And we're getting into communities of practice and it's coming, it feels like 1997, 96 in the internet. That's about a groundswell out of the governments and it's an exciting time and I encourage everyone to get involved with that. The last area I wanted to touch on has to do with everybody in, which is uh, how do we field the whole team? How do we get everybody to have the kind of creative confidence we feel that I felt after I got off that plane and got mentored into this community. You know, that kind of South, South by Southwest feeling. And it doesn't have to be about money, it could be about art or film or tech or whatever it is you passionately want to make. But how do we have everyone feel creative confidence? Because the Dalai Lama wrote about people feeling unwanted. You know, and that's a division in the world right now. Some people feel like they're in the game and some people feel like they're not. So how do we reach out and make sure everybody can do what the Muskogee Creek Tribe Head Start programs are doing with robotics for three and four year olds in Oklahoma? You know, how do we make sure we get that done for everyone? And a friend of mine, Megan Stone, was running the Malala Fund, which we started because I really believe in entrepreneurs and we came up underneath Malala because she knows more about how to fix girls' education than I do. And Megan was saying there's stuff that's inside the building and there's problems that are outside the building. And I think that one of the things we've been doing with diversity is treating it as an outside the building problem when it's actually inside our building. And so the more we do to include people and figure out how to debug our culture so it's not so intellectually combative and dismissive of certain people, the more we'll succeed. We know that diverse teams make better products. They make more revenue. They make extraordinary things. How can we put ourselves in a position uh, where we can have more people, uh, women equally with men, people of all races, uh, in our teams, in our companies, and how do we take responsibility for that as an inside the building problem? So we did a lot of work on that, and uh, I'm proud of how far we got. The last thing I'll end with is just um, when you ask and you broaden out, we were lucky to work with the United Nations at the beginning of the ratifications of the Sustainable Development Goals, the 2030 Goals. We put up a web form, we convinced the UN to do this, they're like, what? Uh, 
put up a web form. He said, one month before ratification, let's just ask the world not what ideas they have, but what have they already invented that's a solution in progress or fully formed in some region? Uh, who would come and give a three-minute lightning talk one hour after we ratify and we begin solving the sustainable development goals on the same day we ratify them as a world? In two weeks, we got 800 submissions from 100 countries. People all over the world are already doing justice work. There were teams teaching law in prison in Uganda. There was a team flying drones to plant a billion trees a year, rapid re reforestation. And there was a team building a floating fab lab in the Amazon. And one of my favorite ones in the last year was one that's really quite extraordinary, and it really speaks to Neri's point about thinking about adjacent things in art. And it was a team doing signal processing to listen to what the whales were saying. And they believe that within five years, we'll speak with whales. Sooner. Sooner. <laughs> Which is just such a wild idea. And so it's, it's from all corners of the globe came this flow of ingenuity and innovation. And so how do we make everyone feel like that passionate thing that they would love to work on includes technology? you know, as one of the pieces of the orchestra or parts of the orchestra that we'll all play. So thank you so much for this award, and uh, thank you for being the house that built me here in Silicon Valley. <laughs>